Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. We obviously have quite a few people out today because of traveling for vacation for Father's Day, as well as a few people that are under the weather. So I do thank you guys for showing up this morning. I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4. That's where we're going to be this morning. I want to speak on this subject, uh, the fatherly workout of Ephesians 6, 4. And so I am speaking to uh, fathers here this morning, but that doesn't mean you ladies have the opportunity to tune out. Um, and so I invite you to find your place in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4. And before we turn there, I want to ask a question. Uh, if you are here this morning, if the Lord has given you the opportunity to be a father, can you remember specifically the day when your first child was born? Can anybody remember the day in the moment when your first kid was born. All right, so for many of us in here, I include myself, I remember with high definition clarity those moments of whenever our first kid was born. I remember where I was at leading up to whenever Forrest was born. Uh, in fact, it was June the 5th, uh, 2013, and it was much like the weather was today, it was super hot, at this time, uh, I was working for Emily's dad, and I had found myself down at Big Ben. If you've ever been to Big Ben, you understand there's no cell phone service. Uh, there's nobody really around where I was at, and Emily was in labor, and so Emily's dad had to come down there and get me. I didn't even have a vehicle down there, so I had to drive his truck all the way back to Brandenburg, and... We took a trip to Louisville. I remember it. It was clear. I remember all the details of all of that happening. I'm sure you remember those events as well. Uh, for me, seeing Forrest being born was almost a supernatural event. Uh, in that moment, I was able to see something that God had created. For me, it was my first experience of seeing something, uh, like I say, God's creation in, in a way that I'd never experienced before seeing a life, this, those first few seconds, those first few breaths, I felt grace in those moments. If you guys have ever been there, you felt that as well. Just unmerited favor towards you and towards your family, and it's something that you, it's hard to describe in words. Today, as a father of six, I had the opportunity to <laughs> experience this a few times with the promise of experiencing it again, uh, hopefully in January. And I'm I'm learning. It's, it's taken me six, soon to be seven times of experiencing this to understand that, finally beginning to understand that my children and my wife are, are apart from Christ, one of my most treasured possessions. Uh, material things begin to fade whenever you begin to reflect on just how much your family means to, to you. Uh, here in just a few weeks, I turn 30. And the Lord is increasingly helping me to understand just how important family is. But I want to talk to you this morning on this subject of fatherhood, not because I've been there six times seeing fatherhood take place. That, that's not the reason why I'm coming to you. I'm coming to, to talk to you men, man to man, not because I've got it figured out, not because I'm a perfect dad, but I'm coming to you because the Bible has specific in, instructions that wants to share with you this morning about fatherhood. And so that's the direction we're headed. Uh, obviously, I've messed up along the way. If I could rewind back to June 5th, 2013, there's so many things that I would do differently. Uh, there's things in raising children that I've learned at, at this point in the game that I would have tightened down on early on. There's things I've also learned that I would have probably loosened up on. So I want to share some of that with you as well as we go through this passage. And uh, I want us to understand, we're, we're about to read this verse, but I'm trying to lay a foundation before we go forward. I mean, what we have to understand is that God has given you, uh, how can I say this, this terrifying power within our lives. Just because you are a father, you have the potential to impact your children in a way that, that no one else does. Just simply because... You're a father. Uh, 
God has given an innate passion. There's a God-given passion that's placed inside of your children for you. Children naturally long for their father. Let me give you an example. Just last week, I was weed-eating back behind the parsonage and behind the church, and then I went over to Mr. Brown's and did a little bit of weed-eating. It was hot. And so I come, and I sit on the porch after I finish my work, and I mean, I was sweating like a mule. I'm just going to be honest. I probably smelled like one, too. And here comes one of my children. I'll leave them unnamed for their protection this morning. And they just come, and they, they climb right up into my lap. I'm, I'm nasty. I'm stinky. I'm sweaty. And here comes a kid, and they want to get up in my lap. And I, say, I can remember. He even said, you smell good. Dad. But I didn't. I don't understand. Children naturally long to be around their fathers. It's just something that God's placed inside of them. So I want us, before we read this passage, to again be reminded of the sobering reality that your children long for you. They want to be around you. They want to have a relationship with you. So we can either grace our children with our presence and our influence, or we can... On the opposite, damn them with our influence and our presence. So it can go either direction. There's people probably within this room that bear the scars on their life from a bad influence of a man. Today, our society is washed up with millions and millions of, of women who are still longing for the affection that their fathers never gave to them. They're looking for affection in all the wrong places. We also have a culture that's scattered with boys who never had a healthy relationship with their father, who never taught them what a biblical man looked like, and so now they're spending the rest of their life searching in this sort of gender confusion and search for their sexual identity through perversion and immorality. So again, being a gospel-centered, Bible-centered dad and father is important. And we see the results of that not taking place every single day within our society. So men, fathers, grandfathers, they're here with us today. There may not even be great-great-grandfathers here. God has graced you with power that you'll have until the day that you... Until the day that you die, like it or not. What you do reflects on your children. How you, as a father, respond to authority will impact the way your children and your grandchildren respond to authority. The way you respond, your attitude towards women, will reflect on how your boys will relate to women and your grandchildren. The way you respond to the lordship of Christ and his church will also reflect on how your children and your grandchildren respond. It'll be, uh, there's so many things that will be impacted. So maybe you're here this morning and uh, you have a regimented plan of fatherhood. You've, you've got it figured out. <laughs> you're setting sail. You're, you're exercising your God-given grace within fatherhood and you're doing great. But maybe you're here this morning and you're just beginning the pursuit within fatherhood to show Christ, to, to teach your children who Christ is and in every way to help them to become like Christ. Maybe you're just beginning. Thankfully, God has provided us a plan in order to pursue this fatherly workout. Again, I'm trying to use the title of the sermon in one sentence. And we see that here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4. So if you've got your Bible this morning, I just want to read this one verse to fathers. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4. Some of you guys know this by heart. The Bible says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So this verse that I just read gives us, for fatherhood, what we should do. But it also gives us the do nots of fatherhood. So that's, what, that's the way we're going to break up our time this morning. We're going to see the do's of fatherhood and the do nots of fatherhood. So the do not, look in your Bibles again at verse number four, is this. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. We're going to exhaust that. We're going to see what that's talking about. And then it goes on to say, 
to give us the dues of fatherhood. It says, but, that's a conjunction there, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So let's start with the do not. What are we not to do as fathers? Now this verse is pretty clear. It's pretty straightforward there. The first part of verse number four, it literally means do not provoke your children to anger. And if you look in the original context at the words, so that they come across with resentment and irritation. So don't provoke them in such a way that they resent you, that they resent the Lord, that they resent their family, and, and that they become irritated. There's a few ways. So for me, that's pretty clear. Okay, don't provoke them to anger. But how can a man do that? It's like how, how would I possibly provoke my children to anger? That's what we're going to spend some time looking at here this morning. How do fathers provoke their children to anger? Let's expose this, and then as it's exposed, let's repent if the stuff that we're doing. So number one, the first way that fathers provoke their children to anger is through criticism, through constantly tearing their children down. There's a famous man by the name of Winston Churchill. Maybe you guys have heard of him, but Winston Churchill's father constantly criticized him. In fact, he, he didn't like the way that Winston looked. He didn't like the way that Winston talked. In fact, he didn't even want to be in the same room as Winston Churchill because he just he didn't like his son. Uh, years later, Winston Churchill's biographer found letters that Winston had wrote to both his mom and his dad begging for his father's affection. In fact, he wrote in, in this letter that he wished he, he could have just become an apprentice bricklayer so that he could just work alongside his dad. That's all he wanted. He just wanted his father's affection. But instead, his dad just nagged him and, and tore him down. And uh, The Bible speaks to that. If you're taking notes this morning, write down Colossians 3, verse number 21. It talks about tearing your children down, about constantly nagging them, uh, discouraging them, and causing them to lose heart. Have you ever seen a kid that that's taken place? Their parents are just constantly just, just nagging at them, and they, it just breaks their spirit. Now, criticism, again, the Bible tells us we're not to do this, but it comes in many different forms besides just the words that we use. Criticism can come, uh, can discourage, well, let me give you an example. Sometimes you'll hear a, a, a student or a sports player, they're out there, they're, they're trying as hard as they can, their dad's just constantly putting pressure on them, and they do well. And then here you see a dad come up behind them and say, hey, you did good, but next time do this and this and this. That's a form of criticism. Yeah, you did good, but you need to do better. And that constantly just, it drains kids. It causes them to become faint-hearted. Sometimes discouragement doesn't necessarily come by the words that we use, but sometimes it comes through the tone of our voice. It's the way we use the words that we have. It can cause a child to lose heart. Sometimes criticism comes through um, distracted eyes. So uh, we can cause our children to lose heart by just simply being distracted. So many kids lose heart because of that today, because their parents have their face buried in their phone. So I begin to ask a question because I, again, before I preach to you guys, I have to work through a passage myself. So I ask myself the question, why are fathers so critical? Why do they never build their kids up but always tear them down? Like their kids are never good enough. I think one of the first reasons why parents can become critical is because it's what's been modeled before them. They're just living out a pattern that they've seen growing up. It's the way their fathers treated them. There's a lot of critical people who mask it in public. They may not be uh, critical out in public, but whenever they get home and they're under domestic pressure, then they become critical of everyone else. They can't restrain their words then. But anyways, God's word here pierces the hearts of fathers, and, and he exposes it. God tells us not to, if you're reading out of King James, not to exasperate our children or break the spirit of our children with criticism. Let me just, because I know it's hot in here, I know we've ate a lot of breakfast, let me just 
Let me just land the plane for just a second. So maybe you're here, like myself, and you're guilty of criticism. You're constantly putting pressure on your kids when they're really doing pretty good. So how can we break this cycle of criticism? Number one, repent. But second, maybe it's a temptation for you to criticize the moment that you, you enter into the driveway or the moment you leave your office. I would encourage you, and, and this is a practice that I'm, I'm learning, begin thinking of good things whenever you arrive at home. All right? So it's so easy to be gone all day, pull up into the driveway, you see the water hoses running. There's, it looks like a bomb went off in the yard. You get inside, you don't even have to open the door because the door's left open. It, again, it's so easy to walk into a situation and be critical. And instead of coming into the, a home with a critical attitude, begin looking for good things. Hey, the, the water hose is left on. It's probably been left on for a couple of, it's not going to have to water the grass, right? Hey, the, the door's left open. Now at least the house doesn't smell like dirty diapers. The point is this. We can break our children and our spouse's spirit by being critical, or we can be proactive and intentional and look for positive things whenever we come home. So that's just, that's number one. That's something that we don't need to do as fathers. But let me, let me share a few more things. Uh, another thing that can discourage your children that can break their spirit is over strictness. Now, let me explain that for just a second. Many times we provoke our children to anger by being overly strict or controlling. Now, I'm going to try to give you a, an illustration. <laughs> Hopefully it'll come out right. Raising children is like holding a wet bar of soap. Okay, track with me for just a second. Now, pick your favorite bar of soap. Irish Spring, I'm just kidding, uh, whatever you use. Now, if you grab that wet bar of soap and you try to hold it too tightly, what's going to happen? It's just going to shoot away from you. But if you hold that wet bar of soap too loosely, it's going to fall from your grip. The same is true raising children. A gentle but firm grip allows you to stay in control. So you can put a lot of pressure on a child, and they're just going to rebel. You can hold the grip too loosely, and they're just going to fall away. But a gentle but firm grip upon your children allow you to stay in control. But the tendency for many fathers is to hold that grip too tight, to become overly strict. Why do they do that? Why do fathers become super strict? overly strict is because they many of them have good intentions honestly uh, they see the increase increasing secularization of, of society they see society crumbling they don't want their children to fall into that so they begin to keep loading and loading different rules but all it does is crush the children they they see that as the only way to protect provide more smothering rules why do they do this? Many times fathers keep piling on rules because they still view their faith in, in view of the law instead of grace. Does that make sense? Like somehow you can earn credit by just piling on rules instead of just by grace. Some men are overly strict. Why? Because they care about what pe people think about them and their children. So maybe they're embarrassed. They, they keep piling these rules on because they care what people think about them. Hey, I don't, I don't want my kid to do that, so here, here's 15 more rules. They squeeze their children's life into fitting their expectations or cultural or the church's expectations. Now think about this for just a second. Because overly strictness is easy for fathers to fall into. That as a godly father, we let's be honest, like we have to say no to a lot of things. So it would be good for us to be intentional to say yes to as many things as we can. Personally, I say no to things I should probably say yes to. Hey, you want to eat forty more Oreos? Just go for it. Like I mean, it's 
Maybe 40 would be sinful. But, but there's some things that we can say yes to that are not sinful. But there's some things that we have to say no to, right? Like There are some things that are unbiblical that parents have to say no to. So, again, we've got to pick the battle uh, and be prepared to explain why something is a no from a biblical perspective, not just from preference. Sometimes we need to understand as fathers that kids need to learn to make their decisions on their own. Uh, they sometimes need to mess up. You, you can't play helicopter parent their, your whole life. So don't provoke your children to anger by being overly strict. Again, keep in mind, I hope, hope that bar of soap illustration sticks with you. Um, all right, L- let me continue on. What else provokes children to anger? The third way that we can provoke our children to anger is through irritability. So just being, uh, well, I use the word nasty. We're just nasty towards people. Uh, we've all seen this. Dad comes home from a day at work, and he's super tired. He's super stressed out. He comes in to his burdened wife, and he just starts unloading all the baggage of the day. And then here comes a little kid up, pulling on the dad's pants leg, and uh, he says, hold on a second. And he's trying to tell his story. And here the kid comes again, pulling on the pants leg. And the dad picks up the kid, swats him on the bottom for being rude. How many times do children's spirit get broken when they're really not even doing anything sinful? We're just being irritable. I mean, this causes children to lose heart. And they've not even done anything wrong. Again, this is a reminder to me as a dad, and I hope it is to you. We can't let the stresses of work affect how we love and care for our families. We can't let pressure from the outside world impact our response to our family. It's easy to treat people one way at work and then come home and act like the devil to our wife and our kids. It's easy to do. We have this sort of persona we have to keep up at work. Then we come home, and people see the real us. Home, this needs to be a reminder to us, home should be the very safest place for our children, a place where they're able to be loved and cared for. and It's a sanctuary for our children, a place where they feel loved, not a place of hostility. So again, we've got to check our hearts. Are we irritable? Because that can provoke our children to anger. All right, so let me move on to another uh, reality that many times provokes our children to anger, and that is inconsistency. Um, Now, let me explain this just a little bit. So many parents dishearten their child by sending their kid mixed signals. You've heard this in Walmart before. Uh, I took took three of our boys... on Monday, last Monday, and we went backpacking for the very first time. You talk about wild. It was, we didn't get eaten by a bear, but we come pretty close. So we went, and we did a couple of nights backpacking down in North Carolina, and then uh, we come back out, and uh, we went to a place called Sliding Rock. Well, there was a lady there who uh, apparently she had a kid that was misbehaving. And she kept saying, I'm going to spank you. I'm going to, like 50 times, and everybody in the crowd's like, just spank her already. <laughs> like, I'm telling you, you dishearten your child whenever you make promises or you're inconsistent in your parenting. <clears throat> and then whenever it's time to spank, you just blow up. They didn't even see it coming. So let me get back on track here for just a second. We need to be consistent in our discipline, number one. So if you tell your child this is wrong, you've got to follow it up with discipline if they break the rules. Every single time. If you tell a child, hey, you've got to stay in the nursery, and what I'm saying is kids can use things. They're sinners at heart. Did you know that? Even in the nursery, they can manipulate a parent. You have to be consistent even every single time, even though it's hard. Now, let me give another example about being consistent. You should never make a promise to your kids that you don't keep uh, because that will also dishearten your kids. 
So let me ask you a question. Do you have any unfulfilled promises to your children? Have you ever made a promise to them and never kept it? Like a fishing trip that never happened? Uh, trips to the park or ice cream? To you, they may be trivial. To you, may, you may say, no, I don't think I ever have. But promises unkept are something that, that kids will keep with them, I mean, 80 years from now. You have to keep your promises to your kids. We're going to talk about it more here at our invitation. I want to move on to another way that we discourage and dishearten our kids, and that's through favoritism. So, like, there's, let's say, three kids in the house, and there's always one you know, hey, that's the golden child. No point in fingers. I know there's siblings here this morning, but uh, we can't show favoritism to our children. Now, everybody track with me. I see some people tuning out. I'm not saying that you have to treat all your children alike. That's not what I mean by favoritism. Because I understand every kid is different. Every single one, one of them is different. Some children require more discipline than others. Some kids, <laughs> stop looking around. <laughs> uh, some kids require more structure than others. Some kids require more independence than others. Some kids require more food than others. Every kid is different. That's just how, how it is. Some kids need more physical affection. Some kids need less. Some kids need more encouragement. But here's the point. No child should ever be favored over another. This is exactly what happened in Scripture with Esau and Jacob. You remember the story? With, I, with Isaac, I mean, how crushing would that be to be raised knowing you're the less favored one? You're number two. I mean, can you imagine how crushing and disheartening? I, that's baggage you carry with you for the rest of your life. So again, uh, I need to get to the the do's here in just a second. So let's just review what we've talked about so far. In this passage, we're seeing the do's and the do nots of scripture. I've given you some examples of the do nots. Let me go over them again. Do, fathers and mothers, grandparents, do not be critical, constantly tearing people down or saying you could do better. Do not be over strict. Remember the bar of soap illustration. Do not be irritable. Do not be inconsistent. Do not show favoritisms. Now let's look at number two this morning. Let's look at the fatherhood's do list. Now look at verse number four. Let's review. The Bible says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. And here's the second part. But bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So there's... I think when rightly understood, there's three elements of bringing children up, three elements of, of doing within fatherhood. And I'm going to share those with you. Number one is tenderness. We, as men, need to be tender. Now, where do we see that in this passage? Uh, in verse number four, it says to bring them up. Now, this word bring them up literally means in original Greek to nourish or to feed. So we as fathers are called to nourish or to feed our children. Uh, this same word in the Greek is also found in, in chapter 5, verse number 29. Let's look back up there. It says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Uh, so that word's used to describe how a man cares for or feeds his own body. So fathers, again, are called to nourish. They're called to feed their children. Again, this carries the idea of gentleness. It carries the idea of being friendly. If you're going to feed someone, if you're going to care for them, you're going to be gentle. Uh, you're going to be friendly towards them. So God calls fathers to be tender. All right, so what does that, what does that look like? We frown on tenderness within fatherhood. What is, what's the Bible talking about? Well, God calls fathers to be tender. There's nothing more manly than to see a first-time father man that's probably never even held a baby before, to have a little newborn wadded up in his arms, just grinning. Like, that's, that's tenderness. That's affection. That's, those things are good. Like, we're to be tender towards our children, not only when they're 
fresh newborns, but when they're school-age children or when they're grown adults, tenderness of a father is a good thing. It's holy. It's biblical. But God doesn't call fathers just to be tender to their children. Fathers are to be tender within the whole context of the home, even towards the child's mother. As I was studying this past week, I found this, and I want to read it to you right quick. Uh, It says this, A child also needs uh, to know that his father and his mother, and his mother, singular, let me clarify, are lovers, quite and apart from the relationship to him. It's the father's responsibility to make the child know that he is deeply in love with the child's mother. There's no good reason why all evidence of affection should be hidden or carried on in secret. A child who grows up uh, with the realization that his parents are lovers has a wonderful basis of stability. So again, that's just a good reminder to dads. Yeah, you need to love on your kids, but you also need to love on your wife in the context where your kids see that. It provides them with security. They know, hey, dad not only loves us, he loves mom. And that's a good thing. I don't want a rabbit trail, so I want to ask a question. So if we're supposed to be tender and gentle, how do we do that as men? So we need to be tender verbally. We need to be gentle with our words within the context of our home. But we also need to be tender physically as well. Now, How does that happen? We as men are naturally harsh and And hard-nosed, how can we become tender? A man that is fully submissive to God's word and God's will, being led by the Holy Spirit, tenderness and gentleness are a fruit of the Spirit. So for a man to become tender and gentle, that means he needs to be in the word. A man who is becoming hard and, 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 and using harsh words with his wife and his kids, it probably means that he's not in the word. It probably means that he's not being controlled by the Holy Spirit. So the solution for us fathers this morning, when we start to become hard, is is to be in the Word. It's to surrender. That's the solution to harshness. So men, how do we measure up? Are we marked by tenderness and gentleness or just cold, harsh words? So the first do of fatherhood is tenderness. Number two is discipline. What do we need to do within fatherhood? We need to actively pursue discipline. Look in your Bible at verse number four. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up. We talked about the nourish, the feeding. Bring them up in the discipline. Now, I looked up this word discipline. So what did it mean? It literally means discipline even by punishment, corporal punishment. Uh, In fact, Pilate even used this word when talking about Jesus. If you're taking notes, Luke 23, verse number 16, he said of Jesus, I will punish him and then release him. This means as fathers, God has called you, not just in this passage, but many others, especially Proverbs, to corporal discipline. The Bible endorses spanking your children. They live under your roof. (laughs) You are called to spank them. Now, some of you guys don't do it right now. I'm not telling you to take your kids out and spank them right now. But listen to what the Bible, that was a joke, by the way. Proverbs 22, verse number 15 says this. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. So the tragedy for us is many people know that kids need to be discipline. They need a good spanking. The problem is they leave that responsibility up to the mother and not the father. And that's a great tragedy within the home. It's not the mother's responsibility to spank the child. It's the dad's. I mean, this is completely unfair to the mom that she has to administer the discipline. It's also unfair to the child as well. It it robs the kids. So, again, fathers are to be the protectors of the home. We see that in various passages of Scripture. So, whenever a child sees their mom administering discipline, then it 
It just mixes up and, and throws out more gender confusion within the home. It's, the man is to administer the discipline and the security within the home. It also tears, think about little boys. When their moms are spanking them, it tears down their self-esteem. Not to be disciplined from the father. Fathers, it is your job to discipline your children, not the mother's responsibility. So, men, do you leave the discipline to your sons and daughters to your wife? If you are, what's happening? There's actively a breach in the domestic responsibility. Like you're actively going against God's word. That's why there's pull within the home. So we've talked about a few things. I want to go to this last point of, of doing within fatherhood, and that's instruction. I, I find this very important. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Instruction literally means to place before their mind. Fathers, it's your responsibility to place before the minds of everyone within your home God's word and his principles. It's, that's the man's responsibility. It literally means to give verbal instruction, to give a verbal warning. Now, there's a man in Scripture who failed to do this. He failed to give verbal instruction. He failed to give verbal warning to his sons. Uh, this guy was one of the high priests. His name was Eli. Let me read to you what happened. This is 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse number 11. The Bible says, And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hear it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible, and he failed to restrain them. So what did Eli do wrong? How did he sin within his family? He failed to confront his boys in their sin. He failed to call them out because what they were doing was wrong. Now what happened? His, his kids were destroyed because nobody ever gave them a warning. The dad just let them go headlong into disaster. He had too loose of a grip. So we have to, again, be reminded of a father's responsibility to warn and to admonish and to teach children. Again, the bulk of the teaching from God's word should land on a father. Mothers instill within their children so much. And they also can teach scripture to their children as well and model it. But the bulk of the responsibility comes and it lands on the dad. That, you know, that's, that's why we were given Proverbs to, to give to, to, to the simple, to make the simple wise. Like Proverbs is, is so helpful in training children. It teaches them about it, anything that life could throw at them. Women, alcohol, decisions, trusting in the Lord, all of those things are covered in Proverbs. That's why we have it. So again, to instruct a children, to instruct children is essential in order to see them raised right. All right, so what does this look like practically? How is a dad practically supposed to instruct his children? Let me give you some examples of how you can do this. Fathers, you have to be involved in practically verbally instructing your kids. They need to hear you read. They need to hear you pray. That's your responsibility as a man. It's your responsibility to regularly lead in family devotions, family prayer. Uh, it's you actively instruct your children whenever you uh, monitor their intake. I mean, what are they watching on television? What are they listening to? If they're under your roof, it's your responsibility. You are to monitor that, whatever goes into their minds. Uh, it's your responsibility to make sure that they have an intentional, gospel-centered fellowship to be involved in. Um, it's your responsibility to lead by example. So 
Let me just review the do's right quick because there's people checking out. So the do's are this. Be tender as a dad. Uh, administer discipline when appropriate. And even physical discipline is appropriate as well. Also, be involved in instruction. But I want to, I want to, I left this out, but I want to include it. There's also another do in fathering. It's, it's fathering takes time. Like you can't, you can't be a father from a distance. Like you actually have to be involved in somebody's life. And I see this as a great struggle today. Uh, there's so much that competes for our time. Let me give you an example. I heard a story about a doctor. I mean, he had a good job. I mean, it was a really good job. He made good money. He made sure that every need within the home was, was taken care of. The family lived in a really nice house. They were able to do any sort of extracurricular activity that they wanted. Uh, if they wanted to go on a vacation, they did. But whenever the father showed up to the dinner table, like he would just kind of be super distant. Uh, People would ask his opinion on things. He'd answer before even really listening to them. Well, one day, this doctor retreated into his, his study. Everybody knew, hey, you don't go into dad's study. You just don't go there. But this dad's in there, and he's writing an article. And uh, as he's writing, a little boy come, his little boy comes in, and he says, hey, dad. And the doctor doesn't even look up. He just opens his drawer, uh, gets out some candy, gives it to the kid and just gets right back to work. And the boy again responds, hey, Dad. And without even phasing him, he doesn't even look up. He just reaches under his drawer, gives the boy a pencil. Uh, and the little boy again says, hey, Dad. And the guy turns around in his swivel chair, and he starts shouting at the boy. He's like, what do you want? Do you not know what in the world could be so important that you would come into my study and disrupt me? And the, little, and the dad just says, what do you want? And the little boy just looked at him with a broken heart and just said, Dad, I just want to spend time with you. I mean, tragically, that's the reality of today. Kids just want their parents. They don't, they don't want big, fancy toys. They don't want all this other. They just want a relationship. They just want time. See, you can't live out the demands of fatherhood from a distance. You can't always be gone. You can't always be involved in your hobby. You can't always be involved in work and be a true Bible-centered, God-centered dad. Like, you have to be at home and help tuck your kids into bed. You have to show up to those extracurricular activities. You need to schedule regular time alone with your children, intentional time. It's not just going to happen. There's probably people in this room that are sitting here and saying, man, raising kids went by like that. And if I could go back and do it over again, I would make intentional time with my kids. So much of what consumed my time was so vain. But I can't get that time back with my kids. I, I endorse taking good, solid vacations because you know what that, that forces you to do? I'm talking about fun vacations. I'm not saying expensive. Go to Academy Sports and buy you a tent or something. But what I'm saying is it, it removes you from the community in which you just have time to spend with your kids. Make time because you can't get it back. And then when you're on vacation or you are spending, like, make, it, make it about them. Savor those moments because they're going to be gone. Men were naturally workers. Well, most, there's some shade hunters, but most of us are workers. You guys know what a shade hunter is? You go to work and they're just looking for shade. Anyways, never mind. <laughs> we many times commit to things that are, at, we say yes to things that cause us to say no to our family. Someone calls us and says, hey, you want to go do this? Well, yeah. But it comes at the expense of our children or to our wife. So we've got to be careful of excessive busyness. Guys, I'm, I'm not going to keep beating the, the bush. I want us to take time to evaluate our fatherhood for just a second. Some of you guys are in seasons of life in which now you're a grandfather or a great-grandfather, and, and you look back and you understand you can't get that time back. I want to ask you some questions so that you can make the most of 
of the time that we have left, okay? So, again, actively think with me through these questions. Uh, I want you to think, what is your heart, what, what is God revealing to you when I ask these questions? Am I weak in this area or am I strong? Number one, do you criticize your children and your grandchildren or do you build them up? If we were to go to your kids and your grandkids, would they say, yeah, they're always building me up. They're always encouraging me. Or is it, hey, you're doing all right, but you could do so much better. Next question. Are you overly strict or reasonably strict? So the, the way it should work within parenting is whenever a child is young, there's a lot of restrictions, and as they get older, you begin to loosen the grip and you give them more freedom. The problem is when kids are so small, we don't really put any restriction on them. That we let them do what they want. And then when they get older, we try to put all the... Have you ever tried to spank an 18-year-old boy? They're going to turn around and spank you back. That's why it's so important to instill it at an early age and then loosen up the grip. Next question. Are you impatient and irritable or are you patient and self-controlled when dealing with your children? Are you consistent in your expectations of your children? I mean, just basic things, cleaning your room, uh, the way we dress. Are you consistent in the rules of the house? Have you kept your promises to your kids? You may say, well, yeah, I think so. Like, this would probably be a good question to go and ask your kids. Hey, was there any promises that I made as a dad or as a grandpa that I never kept? I think you'd be surprised what they might say. And if there is any broken promises, it would probably be a good time to go back and try to make amends. What a testimony that would be. Next question, do you show favoritism? Does the outsiders, does people within your family know, hey, that's the, that's the golden child. Everybody knows. That's what it was when I grew up. I'm just kidding. Uh, are you tender with both your sons and your daughters? As dad, it's easy to be more tender towards the little girls and to boys. Next question, do you share in the discipline? Or do you just shrug off that responsibility as a man? Are you spending time with your children, not only as a family, but also individually? Are you setting aside time? Some examples like daddy-daughter date night. I understand time is hard to come by. It's one of the most precious things that we have. But you'll never forget it. There's a lot of things I want to say right there, but I'd encourage you to even get a journal and write, like even if it's your prayer journal, write down whenever you do take your daughters out or your son out like it's to help bring back those memories. I'm going to ask a few more questions just to kind of, Help us to think through this. What did you expect or what did you want from your father? Just thinking back maybe whenever you were a kid. Is there anything that you really wanted from your dad that you just didn't get? Which leads into our next question. What do your children expect or do they want from you? The reality is, a lot of what we desire and we want in a father, a lot of our earthly fathers never, never lived up to that. But in Christ, <laughs> like, like we have a heavenly father that meets all of those needs. We can find satisfaction in him. So take courage in that. Are you living out the do not and the do of Ephesians 6, 4? Now here's, this is where I want to land, and I promise we're going to be done. What are some of the attributes of your Heavenly Father uh, described in the Bible? So think about our Heavenly Father. What is he? Uh, he's pretty tender, right? He's gracious. He's forgiving. He's patient. And think about all of his attributes, unchangeable attributes of God. Now, what attributes of God 
do you want to emulate within your fatherhood? The answer to that question should be every one of them. Which, now, here's the invitation. What areas do you need to work on as a father? I've, I've given you like a bunch of questions, a bunch of challenges, but specifically as you are seeking to work out, I know that sounds weird, because dads don't work out, do they? I'm just kidding. Uh, how can we practically work out Ephesians 6, 4 within our lives? I'd invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're here this morning and you're a dad or a grandpa and maybe you've messed up along the way, um, I, want you to enc- I want to encourage you that grace has been provided through Jesus Christ. So if you're here this morning and you've messed up along the way, I would encourage you the first step in being a, a good dad is to have a relationship with Jesus. And there's no way that you can be the man that God's called you to be until you settle your relationship with Jesus. If, if you've never done that, I encourage you to do that this morning. And maybe you're here this morning and, and God has been gracious in your life. He's been a good father to you. But you've been sinning. You haven't been bearing the marks of a gospel-centered dad in your life. So I'd encourage you this morning just in your own words to cry out to the Lord and ask him to forgive you. Help him to ask the Lord to help you to exercise servant leadership, to serve your family and to love your family. As the Lord brings things to mind that you've done in the past, I pray you would, you wouldn't overlook them, but you would confess that to him. Let him know that you understand it was wrong and you're sorry and you want to repent, you want to turn from it. Also, just want to encourage a dad that's here that has messed up along the way. It might be helpful if you confess not only to the Lord, but maybe to your wife and to your kids in order to restore a relationship with them. Lord, I just come to you now uh, understanding the great privilege that you've given us to to be called a dad. And uh, Lord, we see all of our insufficiencies and our failures, and we understand that without you, we're going to continue to fail and to mess up. But Lord, we, we pray for strength for every dad that's here, every dad that's represented, every family, uh, that you would help us to get back on track and uh, plow forward with intentionality. And Lord, I do thank you that you've designed things the way that you have. Uh, a man and a woman complement each other. A man isn't worth more than the woman. A woman's not worth more than the man. But Lord, in your good design, you have made it to which we are equal in value, but we have different roles. So Lord, I pray not only for the fathers, but the mothers as well, that they would look at your word and reflect on it, and and we would evaluate our lives and turn from any area in which we're not practicing biblical gender roles within, within our family. I pray for the ones that may be here this morning or may listen online that are living in a season of just gender confusion. They don't know up from down because no one ever trained them, no one ever taught them. I pray you would lead gospel-centered men and women into their lives to teach them and to show them what your word says. Lord, forgive us as a church where we've dropped the ball in teaching. I pray you would help us to continue forward and just help us to be solid. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.